a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now, my one of my favorite verses in the Bible is verse number five. If any man, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of the Lord, which give to all men liberally. Right? I'll say it. The thought came across my mind. Right, verse number James one, verse number five. Pretty good reason for Brother Jordan that uh, you know, in order to be used of God, you don't have to go to Bible college. Right? In order to be used to God, you don't have to take some twelve week program down at the church. Right? If you want to do something for God, God gives you a burden for it, and you want to know how to do it the best way that you can, you know, you should ask about it, God. Why? Because of verse number five. Any man lack wisdom? of God which giveth all men liberally right but anything goes on to say and upbraideth not and it shall be given them there's a promise right there that if you ask God for wisdom direction right instruction on anything in your life that not only will he give it to you last part of the verse is a promise and it shall be given him that's a promise but then it goes on to say and upbraideth not does that mean God doesn't belittle you for not knowing the answer? You should ever ask somebody, well, what's this? And then they give you a talking down to for like 12 minutes before they give you the two-second answer. Right? Hallelujah, our God's not that way. If you desire wisdom from God, He'll give it to you. In fact, He didn't just say that He would give it. He, he promised that it should, shall be given to you. But then verse number 6. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Now, I don't know if y'all know this. Okay, the reason we have tides, right? High tide, low tide, that's because of the moon, right? Pulling on the water, this thing called gravity that God made, right? Well, in the middle of that tide going up and going down, it does make waves. Right? If you don't believe me, take a bucket with a little, you know, little bit of water. Take a bigger bucket with a little bit more water. Dump it in there. What do you think is going to happen? Waves. Right? Well, why is that? Because you're adding to, you're, we're changing the level of the water. That causes rifts. Right? But that's not the reason that waves go in certain directions. The reason that waves go towards shore, or once you get out to sea, they can go any which direction they. They want to. The reason that is is because of the wind that travels across the water. Right? That's what drives the wave. Okay, now what is the wind? Well, the Bible makes a couple of analogies between the wind and the Holy Ghost. Can't see it. Don't know which way it's going to blow. Don't know when it's going to stop blowing. Don't know when it's going to start blowing again. Right? All we know about the wind is when we can feel it. Right? You can't you know, you could try to say, well, it's going to be this, that, or the other. The weatherman got it so wrong last week, right? I don't know why anybody would ever listen to him again. We got an email like a week and a half ago from Duke Energy. There's supposed to be some real bad thunderstorms in the northern Kentucky area. Just want to let you know, we've got a plan. Well, they plan for the storms that don't hit us and don't plan for the storms that do hit us. But anyway, oh, point behind that is the wave doesn't decide where the wave goes. Right? The wave doesn't see which direction the wind's going to be blowing and prepare to be blown in that direction. Okay, a wave is just a wave. It goes where the wind tells it to. Okay, now once a wave starts going, the wave don't stop until it hits the shore. Right, and then what happens? Well, then it gets sucked back out into the ocean. Right, it's a continual process. Well, verse number... 6 tells us you ask God for anything without faith you're like a wave if you ask God in anything other than perfect and unwavering faith you are a wave and why is that you don't ask God expecting to receive right, if you do that where are you you're playing it on the solid rock Believing that not only God can, but God will. Where are you? You're not being driven about with every wind that's blowing. No, you're 
settled, right, planning on the solid rock, which is what? Christ. You're not driven about with the events that happened this day. You're not driven by the wind of what you saw on television. You're not driven by the wind of, well, this is what that person has. You're not driven by the wind of, well, I know that this is what God wants, but I also desire this for myself. Right? A wave is blown by the, any wind. Not just the Holy Ghost. Anything that happens in your life is liable to drive you in a different direction. And we'll get an explanation for that here in a second. But verse number 7 says, For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Doesn't just say what he asks for. It says anything. So here, verse number 7 tells us, I mean, we know that the Bible also says, for without faith it's impossible to please God. But without faith, it's impossible to get anything, receive anything from God. Now notice it doesn't say that let not a man think that he shall ask anything. You can ask God for whatever you want. You can ask God for whatever crosses your mind. Right? But there are very clear instructions in the Bible on what God will and will not answer. First off, anything against the will of God, He's not going to do it. In fact, you're grieving God and daring God to do something about breaking your heart so that your will lines back up with His will. So if it goes against the will of God, you're not going to receive that ever. You can believe it all you want to, but God's not going to go against God to make sure that you're happy. You can either get in line with God or you can be unhappy. Right, but second, if any man ask of God that he may consume it upon his own lust, not going to receive that. May not go against the will of God, may be in God's permissible will, but if you desire it just so that you can satisfy the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the pride of life, God's not going to give it to you. Because you're feeding the carnal man, not the new creature. It's God's will that the carnal man die. The Apostle Paul said die daily. Why would we risen in newness of life? Because that old thing, we don't have any use for it anymore. We're part of that new creature. But then here in this verse, we find that it may be the perfect will of God for you to have it. God may want to give it to you. But if you ask God without total faith, total belief, that not only... It's God's will for you to have it. That God's able to provide it. But that God will do it. Here it says, you're not going to receive. Not because it's not God's will. Not because God's arm is shortened where he cannot reach. Not because God's cattle on a thousand hills have dried up. But because you didn't believe that God could do it. But then verse number 8 says, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now let's just think about this for a second. I hear verse number 8 quoted many, many times just with the context of verse number 8. Now don't get me wrong. A double-minded man, regardless of whatever circumstance it is, is going to be unstable. Right? The Bible does say a man cannot serve two masters, so love one and hate the other. That's not just true when it comes to spirituality and carnal things. That's true in life every day. You cannot be double-hearted where you're torn in two directions and be able to satisfy both of those desires. You're going to have to pick one. Eventually, one's going to pull you away from the other. And that thing that you used to be attached to, you will now hate because you love this other thing more. But why do you hate it? Because it kept you away from the thing that you desired. Now, when I think of a double-minded man, I think uh, several times throughout the Bible, the disciple Thomas, later the apostle Thomas, you'll find that the Bible says Thomas called Didymus. Right? Didymus, Greek word that means double-hearted or double-minded. Right? A double-minded man or woman is not necessarily somebody that is going after two things that are polar opposites. 
Right? A double-minded person. Never do you find that Thomas ever decided to walk away from the Lord. Every time Jesus is somewhere, Thomas is there. He had his mind set up that he's going to follow Jesus. But all that being said, but when it comes to after Jesus resurrected, Thomas wasn't there when Jesus appeared in the room. They go and tell him. He says, I'm not going to believe it. Until I can see the nail prints in his hand and thrust my hand into his side. That Thomas was a very literal man. He only believed what he saw. And if he hadn't seen it, he didn't believe it. Now, if you'd ask Thomas, did Jesus do all these things beforehand? Yeah, 100%. Why? Because he saw it. He was there with Christ. But Thomas, very much like the Hebrews of the Old Testament, unless God did a sign or a wonder to prove that he was God, they didn't believe. But the New Testament says that the Hebrews sought after a sign, but the Greeks sought after what? Wisdom. But Thomas found out that he had an issue with believing the things that he didn't see. But why was he double-hearted? If you asked him, was Jesus the Son of God? He'd have said yes. Was Jesus the Christ? Yes. But could Jesus get up out of the grave? I don't know. I'd have to see it to believe it. But did Jesus raise others from the dead? Yeah, then why, how come he couldn't? I'm not saying he couldn't. I'm just saying I'm not going to believe it until I see it. But he was a double-hearted man. He had one foot in the camp that Jesus was Christ, and he had one foot in the camp of, well, unless I can figure it out, I don't believe that it can happen. Well, there's a whole lot about God that you can't figure out. In fact, a lot of Christians' problems today is that if they haven't seen God do it before, they don't think it's possible. Did he not say, call unto me, and I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not? Well, how can he show you something that you don't know if you already know what it was beforehand? But just asking questions. The truth is, is that the person in these verses that knows they have a need for that God can fulfill. Right? In verse number 5, it was a lack of wisdom. But in verse number 6, he says, regardless of what it is, if any man come to God, but he doesn't have total faith, let not that man think he shall receive anything from God. Why? Because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Verse number 8, in context, is talking about the man that has a lack of faith. So why is that person that asks from God but doesn't believe 100% that God can, will, or is going to do it? Because God can do something. God may do something. Right? But you've got to believe that God's going to do something. Otherwise, why would you ask? That's the double-hearted nature. You know why people go to banks and ask for loans? Because they know the bank has money. If you didn't think that your bank had enough money to loan you for what you needed, why would you go and ask? Very few people, in fact, let me tell you this, zero people come to Brother Jordan to ask him for a loan. Why? Because they know I ain't got it. So why would you ask something of a thrice holy God in heaven that made everything that we see and those things that are unseen and why would you go to him and ask for something that you know that you need, but then not believe that he's able to give it to you? That's why you're double-hearted. It's not because you love God and you love the Word. In this context, it's talking about somebody that believes in God enough to know that God has power to give them whatever it is that they need, but yet doesn't believe that God will, God can, or that God is going to do it. Okay, let's look at an example here. Okay, we have used this example before. Some of y'all are new. You may not know this about Brother Jordan. Brother Doug's thing's Corvettes. I got more refined tastes. If I ever had a drink, if I ever made it big, Brother Ed, I'd get me an Aston Martin. Okay? 
and I wouldn't get an old Aston Martin. I'd get one of the new ones that's got a V12 engine in it. Okay? Because if vroom is good, vroom, vroom, very good. Okay? Now, the reason God is not going to give Brother Jordan an Aston Martin, even though I like the way that they look, like the way that they sound, right? And I would like to think that I am James Bond driving around in an Aston Martin. Okay? Not going to happen because God knows if he gave Jordan twice the cylinders he has right now, Jordan kill himself wrapping it around a tree somewhere. But I do not lay down at night with my head on the pillow and say, Lord, thank you for the day. And oh, by the way, can you give me an Aston Martin? I don't even ask for it. I know I don't need it. I just like the way they look. Okay? In truth, right, could God give me an Aston Martin? Yep. Does God want me to have an Aston Martin? Probably not. Okay, it's not an issue of can God do it. It's an issue of will God do it. Right? Just being honest. Right? That had been one of them things that I'd desire why? To consume it upon my own lust. Okay? Oh, man, that looks cool. Man, that sounds good. Every time I leave a red light, I'm going to hit the gas as hard as it'll go so that everybody else knows I have this car. Right? Just, just being honest. Right? God's not going to give me that one. Okay? Probably couldn't afford the insurance or the gas in it. Okay? 12 cylinder. You're thinking that V8 has gas problems. Imagine a V12. Okay? But, why does somebody ask something of God but then not believe? Well, it's because they either believe that God can't do it which, if that's the case, why even ask him in the first place? Now, you've got a whole lot bigger problem than faith. you got to get in the Word of God and learn who the God of heaven really is. If you don't believe God can, right, either you're not saved or you don't know the God of the Bible. That's true. Because if he could change you from what you were into what you are now, he can do anything. If he could take something that was dead and make it alive... Right. what greater demonstration is there that he took that which was dead in trespasses and sin, robed it in his righteousness, gave it the adoption of sonship, one of these days going to be married into the family of God, and going to be joint heirs to the throne of Christ. If he could do that, what can he do? Just go read Genesis 1. If he can do that, what in the world would stop him or what in the world could prevent him from giving you what it is that you need? I honestly don't believe that people ask of God and doubt that God will do it because they don't believe that God is who he says he is. Right? But every now and then your flesh will tell you that, I don't know, this is, this is a messy situation. God, ex you know, he's an expert in messy situations. You know why I found that out? In the Word. Through the Old Testament, a whole lot of sticky situations there. New Testament, a whole lot of sticky situations there. Guess what God did? He's just liable to show up in the middle of it and fix all of it. Right? So I, most of the time, I don't think it's an issue of them believing that God can. I believe that most of the time it's a situation of God won't. Well, why would you believe that God wouldn't do something that you needed? Didn't He promise that He would meet all your needs? Didn't he say, look at Solomon arrayed in all of his beauty, and it didn't even compare to one of the lilies? Right, and then we find out that his eye is on the sparrow, that he clothes the lily with all of its beauty. He said, if he takes care of all those things, why would God not take care of one of his own? Those are just his creations. You're his child. Right, did he not say that, I can't use the word we like in the verse, but if earthly fathers because I ain't one okay but if earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to their children how much more does God in heaven know how to give us good gifts right he is a holy God everything he does is good he promised that he would meet your needs well sometimes we ask for things that aren't needs and people think well if it's not a need then God may not do it did he not say cast all your cares upon him because he cared for you did he not say that he was touched with the feeling of our infirmity? That we have a high priest in heaven 
You know what the high priest's job was? Was to pray to God for all of the people. You know what that means? Jesus in heaven, our high priest, who was touched with the feeling of our infirmity, is praying to God the Father for you at this moment. So if you pray to God and ask God to give you what it is that you need or something that you desire, maybe a burden, you know that it's in the perfect will of God, you know that it's not against what God would want you to do, you're not asking to receive upon your own lust, right? But you know that, Lord, this is a burden, in my, this is something that weighs heavy on me and I'd like to see you do it. Right? I don't want to pray against the will of God, but Lord, if it be your will, I pray that this happen. Well, if that were the case, you just prayed to Jesus, and God's going to ask God the Father, as our high priest, for whatever it was that you just prayed, plus a whole bunch more that we can't even comprehend that he's praying for. Right when we get to heaven, we realize all the things that Jesus prayed for because we didn't know that we needed them, but He prayed for, the, prayed to the Father for us so that we would receive them. Right, that's going to be at least another billion years of shouting and worshiping just right there. Right, but you're praying it to God, and then God prays it to God. You think God's going to tell God no? You think God would tell one of His own children no if it's in His perfect will? double-minded man is one that doesn't understand all that. You don't even have to understand all that, Brother Ron. Right? There's a whole bunch of kids running around that are praying things right, to a holy God because they know that He's God and they're not. They know that God can do anything, which is true. You know what the problem with most adults is? They forgot that God can do anything. They've seen all the bad things that go on in the world. They think that that's a result of what God did or didn't do. No, that's a result of sin. When we get out into the world, we look at all the bad things that happen out in the world. What's the result of Go all the way back to Adam and Eve. Sin cursed not only man, cursed the world. Why do people die? Sin. Why did COVID happen? Because somewhere that sin. Right? Why is the flu? Why is there infection? Why is there bacteria that you know makes us sick? That's all a result of sin. But in the end, right, the world isn't in the shape that it is because God made it that way. No, the world's as good as it still is because of God's mercy and God's grace. Because God doesn't just wipe us all off the map with fire and brimstone like He did Sodom and Gomorrah. God is able to do exceeding above all that we can ask or think. So as a result, why would we doubt Him? Lord, I know you're able to, but Lord, I just don't think that you will. Or you ask and you hope that God will, but deep down, you don't think that He will. So for the rest of the time we got, we're going to teach on double-minded Christians. Here we're just talking about praying to the Lord, asking in these verses, asking for something that either you need or you desire. Right? Did he not say, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be added unto you? Right? If you're truly seeking after the kingdom of heaven, what's that mean? You're in the perfect will of God, doing exactly what God wants you to do. And in all honesty, if you're in that state, you're not going to desire things that go against the will of God. Why? Because everything that you do is for His honor and His glory. You're laying up treasures in heaven. And where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And vice versa. Where your heart is, that's where you're going to lay up treasures. So, double-minded man, right, does that mean that he's out of the will of God? He may be in the permissible will of God. You may be going out every day, doing your best, Right, to shine a light to the community, your neighbors, as the Bible would call them, the people that you run across. But, if you're double-hearted, double-minded, 
Right? You may go out and you may do, but are you doing it with all that you have? Because the moment that you think that God can't use you, you'll stop trying to be used of God. But what's it take to be used of God? You've got to be obedient. You've got to be willing. Right? Jonah could have said, all right, Lord, I'll go to Nineveh, but then he wait 10 years to go. No, that don't work. You've got to be willing to do it when God says to do it. And you've got to be willing to do it the way that God said to do it. Right? God told Moses to stretch forth his staff and command that water come out of the rock. What did he do? He smote the rock. God wasn't pleased because Moses didn't obey instruction. That's why I got a problem with that old song, Take Your Shoes Off, Moses, Be on Holy Ground, because the second verse says, God told Moses to smite that rock. No, he didn't. In fact, God told Moses to do the exact opposite of that. And because Moses smote the rock, Moses didn't get to go to the promised land. He died in the wilderness. Did Moses do the right thing? Well, he did what God told him to, and then some. And then there's a whole bunch of instances where people do what God tells them to, minus a little bit. And you know what God's response is to all of it? He's never happy with it. He never accepts it. Why? Because it wasn't the perfect will of God. God told you to do, and if you don't do it, it it's not going to turn out the way that God said it was going to turn out. Well, furthermore, if you don't think that God can use you, eventually you're going to stop going. Some people go because they're hoping that one day a light bulb is just going to, you know, come on in their head and whatever it was that they were missing, right, this magic piece of the puzzle is going to turn them into this super Christian. That's not how that works. God uses the weak things to confound the wise. God uses base things. But you know what that is? Simple things. He doesn't use super soldiers. He doesn't use people that look like the Hulk. Right? Samson didn't look like Captain America. Samson looked like a scrawny, you know, only skin and bones, shorter than everybody else. You know, you blow on him too hard and he's going to disappear. Right? But yet God used that man to do many great works of strength. Why? To prove that it wasn't Samson that was doing it. It was God. You're never going to be enough for God to use you. What you can be is you can believe enough in God to be used of Him. Right? Anybody believe that they can raise their hand today and say, I'm going to get to a point in my life where I'm exactly what God needs me to be to start using me. No, God can use whatever He wants. God's not looking for your ability. Right? The arm of flesh is going to fail us. If we do anything for the Lord, it's because He gave us the power to go out and do it. It's not because we're enough. It's because He's enough and He chose to use us. Right? When you think that way, it doesn't matter what I think I am, how I see myself. All that matters is that when God looks at me, He sees His Son. And because he sees the obedience of, Lord, I know I'm not perfect. But, Lord, I'm going to go out and do what you told me to do because I believe that you can use somebody like me. Not because I'm special, but because you're special and you can take me and do anything with it. He used a donkey to preach to Balaam. Right? If he can use a donkey, he, he can even use Brother Tommy. Okay? He dressed up like a donkey one time for one of the Christmas programs. Yeah. What's the point? Even when it comes to your daily walk. You're not going to go out and live right if you don't think that God can use it. You may know that it's right to go out and, you know, be ye holy. Sin not. Right? To strive for righteousness. To lay off the old man and put on the new man. To embrace the fruit of the Spirit. You may know that all those things are good, but unless you believe that you need to do it, you're not going to do it problem with most Christians is that they know what God wants them to believe they just don't believe they need to be all of it you know what you need to be what God said you know what you don't need to be what God said not to be right double minded Christian not just in the way that you live not just in you know the example in scripture on things that we pray about 
right? But a double-minded Christian in truth is one that has one foot in the old man, one foot in the new man. A double You were never double-minded before you got saved. Right? Anybody remember before you got saved? Anybody question the fact that sinning was just natural to you? Right? Anybody before you got saved question the fact that it was okay for you to go out and do what you want. You desired that nobody have an input on it, and you did it not because somebody else told you, but because it felt good, and that's why you chose to do it. That was your nature. Right? You never doubted it. But yet, after we get saved, that's where you find people start getting double hearted. Why? Because you're torn in two different directions. That is the until we either reach the river Jordan and we cross through death or until the Lord comes back through the rapture, right? That's going to be the struggle that we have in this flesh. That's the struggle that Jesus warned you about. That's the struggle that He tried to equip you for in all of the New Testament was to put on the armor of God. Why? So that you can withstand the wiles of the devil. Right? He also tells us to lay off the old man. Why? Because it's dead. He said, take up your cross and follow me. Why are we taking up a... Jesus took up his cross and left it on Calvary. Why do we take ours with us? Because our dead man goes with us. I'm stuck with it until I get that new body. So I need a place for it that it's not free to go around. Where's that? It's on the cross. I got to nail it down so it don't get back up off. So that it doesn't wrestle with me. So that it doesn't hinder me. Right? But he said that he made us kings to rule and reign over this flesh in the book of Revelation. He said that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So a double-hearted Christian, in all honesty, is one that's trying to live both in the carnal and also in the spiritual. You believe enough that God can, but that carnal man doesn't believe that God will. You believe that you need to be what God made you into, but you also believe that you can still be these other things carnally, and God will be okay with it. You believe that you need to go out and do these things because God commanded you to do it, but you're also believing that God's going to use somebody else because He can't use you. You believe that you need to come to church, but you don't believe you need everything that the preacher teaches. Where does that double-mindedness come from? comes a, a disagreement between here in your soul and here in your flesh. Right, but how many times has our pastor said that 90% of your spiritual warfare happens right here? Why is that the case? Because this is arguing with what God put down here. In truth, you're not really double-hearted. Right? Your heart's deceitfully wicked no man can know it. But by the grace of God, He saved your soul and sealed it until the day of redemption. And the Holy Ghost will give you holy desires for you to desire in your life. We don't rely on our heart. We relied on the guidance of the Holy Ghost, who God promised would lead and guide us into all truth. The discrepancy comes when those desires of our soul, the new man, are in conflict with the desires of the old man. Well, Lord, I don't understand how you're going to do it. He didn't tell you to understand it. He just told you to believe. If you knew how he was going to do it, it wouldn't be faith. It'd be logic. If you knew what God could do before he did it, right, it wouldn't be faith. You do know that the Israelites, after the first day that they received manna in the wilderness, I guarantee you there were some of them that said, well, God fed us yesterday. What are we going to do today for food? Because keep in mind, the reason they spent 40 years in the wilderness was because all those stiff-necked, uncircumcised of heart Israelites that ultimately didn't believe that God was going to do what He said He was going to do, they had to die off in the wilderness. Why? Because of their unbelief. It wasn't because God wanted them to suffer. It's because they didn't believe that God was going to do what God promised He was going to do. They were double-minded. Why? Because their head and their heart told them something different than what God said. And they couldn't reconcile the two. 
Can I tell you this? You're never going to be able to make sense of the spiritual things using non-spiritual things. You cannot explain spirituality through the lens of the world. I can explain the world through the lens of spirituality, but it's not because I'm super spiritual, just because of the fact that God's Word tells me why the world is the way it is. It also tells me what it's going to turn into before He comes back. And we're going downhill. But the whole point of spirituality is it's not what I can understand. It's what I'm willing to allow God to do in my life. God wants to do for each and every saved Christian on their way to heaven the exact same thing in their life. And to be honest with you, but Brian, we know that the Apostle Paul, right, one of the greatest spiritual men to ever live, God said that John the Baptist was the greatest man ever born a woman. Right, we go back into the Old Testament, we look at people that God used to do mighty things, people of great faith. Right? You can't tell me that Daniel, Meshach, Abednego, and that's the one. I was thinking of their Hebrew names, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, but y'all wouldn't have known who they are. Right? But you tell me those four men didn't have great faith? to have the feast of the king set out before them and they said no we're not going to eat that because that's not right in God's eyes instead give us beans and lentil soup for the whole time that you know the king said to get us healthy and we believe God's going to make us whatever the king desires us to be guess what they were stronger and fitter than any of the other ones yeah, you think it's any wonder that that guy had a problem when he was thrown into a lion's den thinking that God was going to handle it no you say, was Daniel super spiritual? No, Daniel just believed God. Right, look at Joseph, all that he went through in his life. I don't know that that's I mean, all throughout it, he knew that he was where he was because that's where God wanted him to be. He didn't understand it, but he also didn't question it. You know why God was able to use Joseph? Because Joseph never got bitter at God for where Joseph was. You know what that takes? A rejection of the carnal man and embracing the fact that even though bad is happening in my eyes this is all for God's good that takes a lot of faith especially when you're hurt when you've been cast out he's left for dead by his brothers a couple of times other people tried to kill him why? because he's just doing right by God and through it all what does God use him to do? to be the savior of his own people and bring his father and his brethren into a place where they would have a safe haven during the middle of a great famine. He was the second most powerful man in all of Egypt in his day. Only the Pharaoh was more powerful. You know why that happened? Not because Joseph was some great thing. No, Joseph was just a man that was left for dead. But God purposed that as long as Joseph would believe in God, that he was going to use Joseph to do something great. Something that was needed carnal man can't explain all that you can't rationalize why God chose to use Joseph Joseph was just another boy in fact he was the one that Israel loved the most it says his favorite son that's why his brethren got jealous of him but there was nothing special about him he's just flesh and blood like you and here's the real kicker he didn't have the indwelling spirit of the Holy Ghost he did it without the Holy Ghost living in him. You saying they had more faith, Brother Jordan? No, I'm just saying that they didn't have all the assurances that we did. They were looking ahead by faith to what we would have. We look back knowing what we have and what they didn't have. They didn't have the completed Word of God. At that point, most of it hadn't even been written. Joseph lived before Moses. You all know that, right? because Moses was in Israel but, well who wrote down the story of Joseph it was a guy by the name of Moses they didn't have the Bible they might have had the book of Job that's the oldest book of the Bible that had been recorded but what did they have they had oral traditions that had been passed down and they had people that instilled in them a fear of God and faith in God 
So according to your Bible, the reason that things in your life are always unstable is because you're leaning on both natures. What Jesus say when he talked to John in the book of Revelation about the church at Laodicea, he'd spew them out of his mouth because he was neither cold nor hot. What was their problem? They were double-minded. They believed that God had saved them, but they believed that they didn't need God for all the things in their life because they were increased with goods and had need of nothing. Oh, how wrong they were. You need them every second of every day. But, when James says, let, that, let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. You think you're really going to be blessed of God? That you're going to have the mercies of God in your life? That you're just going to be dripping with grace if you don't believe God? If you're double-minded and you're trying to walk both paths of life, the old man and the new, you really think God's going to be pouring out blessings on somebody that wouldn't appreciate them or use them? He doesn't just say, don't let the man think that he won't receive what he asked for. He says, no, it doesn't matter what you ask for. Don't think you're going to get anything from God. Because those that come to God must be a believer that he is and that he is able. What's that mean? That he's God, Jehovah, the God that lives, the I am that I am, right? that God, and that he will do it for you. That he's able to do what it is that you've asked him. Why would you get up out of bed in the morning and read the Bible if you didn't believe that a holy God could use a holy word to make a difference in your life? If you don't believe that you're reading it because God's going to use it to do something for you, why are you reading it? Like God's not impressed with the actions. He's impressed with the intents of your heart. Man looketh on the outward appearance. God looks on your heart. You may not be the smartest, may not be the most able, but if your intent is to do it for God's honor and God's glory, there's no telling what God will give you if you're willing to do it the right way for His honor, in His will, not for your own credit, but so that you can lift Jesus up and He'll draw all men unto Him. Right? True faith is not just believing that God can, it's believing that God will. And that regardless of whatever the world does to try and stop it, he'll do it anyway. That regardless of the fact that we're still in sin, cursed flesh, regardless of the fact that we may believe in part and then not understand in part, and we pray, Lord, help my unbelief. He just takes pity on us. Or the Bible says sometimes he winks at our ignorance, thinking that we've got things figured out and we know that this is what we need in our life, Lord. But he winks at our ignorance and he gives us what we need anyway. Right? The requirements to be used of God to live a good life are very simple. That's why the teens used to think that the answer to every question I asked back in teens class was faith. I can't say that faith is the most important thing in your spiritual life, but I can't say this is pretty important. Because without it, you can't do anything to please God. Without it, you wouldn't have got saved. That's why God gave unto every man a measure of faith. And I do know that the faith that He gave you is not enough faith for you to live on for the rest. It's enough for you to get saved. That right? is enough to get your foot in the door, but then what? Lord, grow my faith. Mature my faith. Not just my faith in the sense of what I believe, but no, Lord, how strongly and how certain I am convicted of the things that I believe. Because right? then when you go out in the world, it doesn't matter what the devil throws at you, your faith is solid. You won't believe in part and doubt in part. You'll just believe regardless of what happens. That's it. We'll take a short break. Get ready for worship.